This podcast contains violence, adult themes, and material that may be disturbing to some listeners. Listener discretion is strongly advised. True North True Crime is produced on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. We feel like we're in a movie. Like we have, like, our life since this happened, we had our mourning period, for sure. Um, But we had a feeling this was going to happen. Like, you know, you just had that gut feeling. It's just a lot of red flags, just how they acted, how they talked, how they they treated everything. We just knew something was going to happen. Um... And there was nothing that we could do to protect it or stop it from happening because we tried. And every time we went back to court and we tried to fight for, you know, to protect Tegan, the courts would just shut us down. No, you're being, you're being um, ridiculous. You're being unfair. You know, she deserves to have her grandparents in her life. They raised her for X amount of years. So there's so much fighting and so much like judgment from the actual courts themselves for literally trying to protect this child. On July 8, 2021, a seven-year-old Calgary child was witnessed boarding a plane from Vancouver to Turkey with her abductors by her side. Her abductors, Luan Bas Hassan and Mustafa Mohammed Hassan, were known to the little girl. They are her maternal grandparents. Using forged documents and other illegal means, the grandparents smuggled the Canadian girl out of the country undetected. It is believed that their final destination is Egypt. More frustrating was the fact that this was not their first attempt. At home in Calgary, a young father is fighting international and local jurisdictions to bring his daughter home. This is the abduction of Tegan Coots. And this is True North True Crime. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 31 of True North True Crime. Thanks for joining us. We want to shout out some folks for buying coffee this week, so a big thank you to Blair M., Van City Jilly, Jody T., Haley, Andrew, Thomas, Maggie G., and two anonymous donors. True North True Crime is a self funded and independent podcast bringing awareness to missing people and victims of violent crime in Canada. If you would like to donate to the podcast, you can do so at buymeacoffee.com slash tntcpod. It can be a one-time donation, or you can become an honorary producer of the podcast by choosing the $5 a month member option. If merch is more your thing, you can pick up some TNTC merchandise like t-shirts, tank tops, mugs, and stickers through our Tee Public store. We will link that in the show notes. If you don't have the means right now, but you want to help out the podcast, you can leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts for free. Those really do help with the visibility. Okay, that's enough of the chit-chat. Let's get into tonight's episode. So tonight we are talking about the international child abduction of seven-year-old Tegan Coots. Tegan was abducted by her grandparents in July of 2021. This occurred in Calgary, Alberta, and it is a very recent and ongoing case. Tegan was taken out of Canada on forged documents and flown to Turkey. It is believed that her grandparents' intended final destination is Cairo, Egypt. Her father, Justin Coots, was granted full custody of his daughter Tegan by the courts. He told the courts numerous times that he believed Tegan would be abducted by the grandparents, but no one intervened. The grandparents, Luan Bas Hassan, and Mustafa Mohammed Hassan 
are wanted on multiple Canada-wide warrants in relation to Tegan's abduction. If you have any information on this case, you are asked to call Crime Stoppers, the RCMP, or the Calgary Police Service. We put this episode together with publicly available news articles, Alberta family court documents, and we also did an interview with Coots family spokesperson, Nikki Ershenkov. We will be relying heavily on Nikki's accounts of this crime. We have read all of the legal documents that back up everything that she shares in this episode. This episode starts in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Calgary is actually the third most populous city in Canada with a population of almost 1.6 million people. Geographically, Calgary is in southern Alberta and sits on Treaty 7 territory, which includes the traditional land of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Tutina Nation, the Stony Nakoda Nation, as well as the Métis Nation. In the present day, Calgary is an energy town, and it is susceptible to the ups and downs of the oil and gas industry. Alberta can sometimes be jokingly referred to as the Texas of Canada for its reliance on natural energy and its conservative roots. But in cities like Calgary, you will see a very diverse population with mixed politics and views. Culturally, Calgary also has a pretty thriving food and art scene. They also have an undying love of their NHL team, the Calgary Flames. Crime-wise, Calgary is actually a really safe city. In 2018, it was listed as the 76th most dangerous place in Canada out of a list of 237 Canadian communities. If you think about the fact that it is a major Canadian city, that is a pretty good ranking. So Tegan Ann Coots was born in Calgary on September 21st, 2013. Today she is seven years old with hazel eyes, dirty blonde hair, and pierced ears. She stands four foot tall and weighs 45 pounds. Tegan is described as a vibrant, sugar and spice and all things nice type of kid. She loves watching YouTube shows like Mr. Beast and Gloom Games. She loves video games, unicorns, Frozen, and Barbies. According to people close to Tegan, finding what she doesn't like is the hard part. Tegan loves everything and everyone. She is a sensitive and empathetic child and likes it when everyone around her is happy and getting along. In order to tell Tegan's story, we have to tell you the story of her late mother, Chelsea Bass, and her father, Justin Coots. So let's start off with her father, Justin. Justin is a Calgary guy through and through. He grew up there, he is currently 33 years old, and he works as a journeyman Red Seal parts technician. So he works in various industries in Alberta that need machines serviced, which is basically all of the industries in Alberta. We asked Nikki what Justin is like. Uh, so Justin, uh, he works in parts. He has his like red seal tickets and every everything like that. So he works with auto parts. But Justin is the most patient person I have ever met in my life. And I consider myself well-tempered, but he makes me look like a crazy person. Um it, his life could be literally falling apart like it is right now and he can have a calm demeanor and think logically and clearly in order to move forward he's well level head he's level headed and like he's he's a, he's a saint honestly and i don't use that word lightly <laughs> yeah he grew up in calgary so he's been in calgary all his life Grew up in Forest Lawn, which is not necessarily like the nicest neighborhood. Um, but Justin never fell into like the scene that a lot of people in low income areas do, where they're partying and using a lot of drugs and stuff like that. Justin was like out of high school, into work, furthering his education. He wanted to kind of break the cycle of his like family lifestyle, and he wanted to have the wife, the family the house, the car, the white picket fence story kind of deal. That was always his goals, and even to this day, it still is. So as Nikki just said, her, Justin, and Chelsea all grew up in the Forest Lawn area of Calgary. And it was in Forest Lawn, just shortly after high school, that Justin and Chelsea would meet and fall in love. So they met when Chelsea was 19. Uh, so she was out of high school for two years at that time. And uh, they met through um, a mutual friend slash family member. Uh, his Justin's brother was Chelsea's friend, and Chelsea went over, and that's how they ended up meeting, and they just hit it off right away. Chelsea had 
really bad experiences with relationships prior to Justin. So she did have a lot of trust issues. Um, the last relationship she was in, it was a long-term relationship. It was very toxic, very unhealthy. She was cheated on a lot. It was very abusive. So she got into this relationship and she was apprehensive and conscientious on like everything. So if he looked one way, what is he looking at or who is he talking to? So she was really suspicious. But on that note, she was, I've never seen her so happy in a relationship since her and I had gone together as friends. They had a very healthy relationship and they loved each other very much and they were supposed to get married as well. Obviously, like most relationships, this one also had its ups and downs, but it seemed as if Chelsea and Justin were committed to building a life together. Eventually, the couple got pregnant. So Chelsea would give birth to Tegan on September 21st, 2013. After Chelsea gave birth to Tegan, the young couple would run into some issues and they would temporarily split up with the intent to get back together. But sadly, this story would take a tragic turn for the young couple. So through her pregnancy, she was living with Justin. Um, after she, after they had Tegan, like they had a really good pregnancy, um, you know, considering like she, she was healthy throughout her pregnancy. She never had any issues during her pregnancy, no blood pressure issues, nothing. Um, and on that note, she was also anemic. So it was kind of a blessing that she didn't have any issues through her pregnancy um had they gave birth to tegan on time like no issues at all but after tegan was born you know with the um postpartum they were getting into arguments and they weren't just getting along and chelsea ended up moving back home with her parents so with luan and mustafa um, and granted, like Chelsea passed away when Tegan was seven months old. So this is a really like quick time frame here. So while they took this break apart, they were co-parenting and they were co-parenting very successfully. They were talking every day. Chelsea would send Justin like videos of Tegan, like in the morning, like say good, good morning to daddy. And, um, they were actually talking about getting back together before she passed away. They were already like going and spending nights at each other's houses. They were doing stuff together as a family and just slowly kind of building that comfortability to officially move right back into him, into his house. And then one day she just, she just dropped. She, um, uh, uh, she had a blood clot the size of an apple get lodged between her lungs and she was rushed to hospital. And, um, the doctors and nurses were fantastic. They did everything that they could. They decided to pull the plug, essentially. So, tragically, on April 24th, 2014, Chelsea Bass would die from complications due to a blood clot. She died two months short of her 22nd birthday. This is obviously tragic. Just seven months after giving birth, Chelsea Bass would die, leaving behind her baby Tegan and her partner Justin Coots. She died before she could celebrate her first Mother's Day with her baby. Justin was obviously heavily emotionally impacted by the loss. Justin was a wreck. Um, and then compared to, I'm sorry, now I'm going to get emotional. Uh, compared to how he's feeling right now with Tegan being taken, uh, he said to me that this is exactly how he felt when he lost Chelsea. So, and Justin hasn't even dated since. Chelsea passed and that was close to seven years ago now um no he lo he loved her and he was destroyed uh he felt like he lost everything in his life he lost the love of his life and he had no idea what to even do it was almost like this numb feeling so we need to take a moment to introduce Luann and Mustafa from what we gather, Luann gave birth to Chelsea on June 24, 1992, in Sudbury, Ontario. She then moved to Calgary, Alberta, and as a single mother, raised Chelsea. At some point in the early 2000s, Luann met Mustafa online. It is believed that he lived in Egypt at the time. Eventually, the two were married and Mustafa moved to Canada. Both Mustafa and Luann now hold Egyptian and Canadian passports. Luann and Mustafa worked at the Costco on Heritage Drive in Calgary and owned a home on Fonda Green. 
They also opened a business called Baraka Dream of Egypt, selling imported Egyptian items at flea markets in Alberta. Outward appearances would suggest that Luann and Mustafa were both quite likable in the community. Luann presented as more outgoing, while Mustafa was more quiet and reserved. But a closer look at them would reveal some deceitful behaviors behind their normal status quo appearance, including hiding large sums of money from the CRA, forging government documents, and providing false testimony in court. Yeah, so they actually met online. Uh, Luann took Chelsea out to Egypt to meet Mustafa for the first time. Chelsea hated Egypt as well. Uh, Kind of important, kind of not important. I mean, it's important to me because, like, Chelsea hated Egypt and they spread her ashes there. So, you know, it goes to show on how little they care about anyone other than themselves. So they went to Egypt and then, like, within a year, they were... Uh, He was moved to Canada and stuff like that. So the uh, import-export business, so they had items coming in from Egypt. This started in 2010, three years after Mustafa moved from Egypt to Calgary. They got married. He got a citizenship, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, They started off uh, with a booth at the flea market here in Calgary, and then they did the Christmas craft shows and stuff like that. I actually have some really beautiful... Christmas ornaments from Chelsea from their business um, that she gave me in like 2010, but because the business had just opened up. Um, And I don't know if I added it into the information that I gave you, but they were saying they're only making a couple hundred dollars like every couple of days. But we recently just found out that they were trying to destroy (laughs) business receipts from last year and they were making minimum a thousand dollars a day, maximum $7,000 a day on their business. And they were hiding this money and sending it off to Egypt this whole time for like at least three years uh, into an Egyptian bank account because the police have confirmed that it's they've this is at least their third attempt to try to leave the country within the past two years. They were caught in court for hiding funds. They had sent over $170,000 over to Egypt. So Justin reached out to Mustafa and Luann for help after Chelsea died. It is completely understandable to reach out to family for help during a crisis, and for things to turn out how they have is something very few people could have predicted, including Justin. But for him, the red flag started to show up early. Although things would start out okay, it started to become clear that Luann and Mustafa had their own plans for Tegan, and they didn't want Justin to be a part of those plans. So this is where the manipulation game started right away. Uh, What happened was, is when Chelsea ended up going to hospital, so she went to the hospital uh, pretty early into the afternoon, and then she passed away around 2 o'clock in the morning. So she was in the hospital for about 12 hours. Uh, Justin was unemployed at the time, but had a job interview the day that Chelsea went into the hospital. Um, When Luann called him and said, Chelsea's in the hospital, Justin was going to cancel his interview and she said no Chelsea won't forgive you you've been trying so hard to get this uh to get some interviews and find work like go to this interview we'll be here and she ended up using that against him in court saying that he didn't care about that that Chelsea was in the hospital at all so Justin ended up going to the interview he ended up getting the job but it was an out-of-town job and it was the only work that he could get at the time because Calgary was going through a recession so work was really hard to come by and now he had to provide for his only child and it was him doing it by himself so he took what he could get um so he went to the hospital right after the interview um he was there when chelsea passed he was with his daughter and then after chelsea passed luann approached justin and said listen like tegan just had a major loss in her life you've had a major loss in her life let's not make the trauma worse and we'll just keep a hold on tegan for a little bit you work out of town until you can find work in town so that was the original plan and it made sense uh, to Justin as well, too, because you you want what's best for your children. You don't want them to have this trauma, and then all of a sudden their entire like life schedule is completely disrupted. So it was trying to mitigate the damage that Chelsea's passing had caused. Um, but that's when everything, like like I said, they started manipulating like soon as Chelsea, like even before Chelsea's heart stopped beating, the manipulation games were starting. Um, so Justin was working out of town for... I think it was like six months. Um, and Luann and Mustafa said, hey, like you're out of town. You only see her on the weekends. We're taking her to her doctor's appointments. We're doing this. We're doing that. 
um, let's sign a temporary custody. Let's go to court, do a temporary custody order. It will only last six months. By that time, you'll be able to find work in Calgary and we'll start transitioning Tegan into your care full time and we can just be grandparents. So they ended up going to court. They got temporary custody. This is in 2016. Uh, So they got temporary full custody of Tegan. And during this six months time, they had taken her on trips to Egypt. They had taken her to Cuba. They'd been going to all the doctor's appointments. They were full-time caregivers and Justin had her every single weekend. And during that six months as well, Justin organized uh, a layoff with his work so he could come back to Calgary. So he ended up going on EI because he was like, no, I like, I can't do this after the six months. I want my daughter back. Um, Also a bit of a side note here, Kelsey and Justin owned a condo at the time of her passing. Um, And this is important uh, for the sole reason of the life insurance policy that was on the mortgage. So the mortgage was completely paid off upon Chelsea's death. Uh, Justin ended up selling the condo and then buying a townhouse in which Tegan can grow up in for like for the rest of her life and give it to her when she became 18 (laughs) sort of deal. Like he just, he had a plan to make sure Tegan lived as normal as the life as she could without her mom. Luana in turn would tell everybody, including myself that Justin had stolen life insurance money from them and they owe him like over like $200,000. And this played a lot into court as well too. And they were called out for it by the judge and the lawyers and said, no, that's not life insurance money. That was the policy that was on the mortgage. And that money is entitled to Justin. So just to summarize here, after Chelsea's death, Justin was struggling. Uh, He was struggling with the loss of his partner. He was struggling to find consistent work and he had found himself a single parent. Then Luann and Mustafa came to the rescue, and during this time, they took temporary custody of Tegan, and Justin had agreed. It was his understanding that after six months, the temporary custody would default back to him, and this is factually true. But on the day of the court hearing that would have returned Tegan into Justin's care, Luann and Mustafa got into a car accident. This resulted in Justin no-showing at the hearing. This no-show, while not illegal, would cause the court to reflect poorly on him. This would set in motion a horrific custody battle between Luann, Mustafa, and Justin for full custody of Tegan. Here is Nikki with Justin's side of the story of what happened that day. The day uh, the court proceedings were to change from the temporary custody and start the transitioning to Justin's care, Justin was at the courthouse. They were due to be in court that day. And Luann calls him and says, we got in a car accident downtown. So the courthouse is downtown Calgary, and they got in a car accident downtown, which was legit. Um, Justin ended up arranging for them to get a friend to come down with a flatbed, help them get it towed for free. And he's like, okay, well, what do you want to do about court? Um, Like, I'm here now. And Luann says to him, "Uh, you know what, like, it's supposed to just default after, after this, and we'll just work together one-on-one. We don't need to go to court. We can work on this transition phase now. So you go back to work. Don't lose a day's pay. You know, we'll get the car back and then we'll have a a family meeting and we'll work on our transition plan. Uh, So Justin went back to work. He kind of messed up on that one. He should have just stayed in court because this ended up making this long court battle. So Luann shows up to court with Mustafa and said, Justin forgot, he does not care, and they want to keep Tegan. But in the actual transcript, if you're reading it, they're contradicting themselves. So Mustafa would start talking, and then Luan would correct them. And like they, their t- story was consistently changing in this two-page transcript. And the judge completely removed Justin's right. He, he got, like, weekends, they just permanently gave the grandparents guardianship for the foreseeable future. He should have stayed in court. He should have just done the court date because according to a judge, he no-showed. It looked like he didn't care about his daughter. And the court's like, yeah, sure, you can keep keep custody. Obviously, he can't be bothered to show up. So this was clearly an error in judgment by Justin. And it is something that Justin acknowledges. If he had gone to court that day, the custody would have automatically defaulted back to him. But because he didn't, it was used against him. This is a mistake that would cost him dearly, because what followed was a brutal and drawn-out custody battle. Mustafa and Luann used the courts to dehumanize, 
defame, and bankrupt Justin in order to take full custody of Tegan. The details of the custody battle are under a publication ban in order to protect Tegan. We will not quote directly from the papers, but we can summarize some of the findings. What we can say is that Luann and Mustafa accused Justin of being a drug user. Justin submitted to a hair follicle drug test, and it was shown that he was not a drug user. Luann and Mustafa accused Justin of being abusive towards Tegan. These allegations were also proven false in court. Luann and Mustafa also tried to claim that Justin stole Chelsea's life insurance. This was also false, as her policy was attached to the mortgage that they shared. Here is Nikki with her perspective on how it all went down. So it was a four-year court battle from there. So it was affidavits sent back and forth and a huge mudslinging fest. Um, up until the three-year mark, uh, Luann and Mustafa were telling me stories like, oh, Justin's abusive, he's this, he's that. Like, the typical, like I said, mudslinging is literally the best way I can explain it. And I actually genuinely, like, was really mad at Justin. I actually hated him. Um, because I had only heard like this one side of the story. Oh, he's beating Tegan. Oh, he's, you know, using drugs in front of Tegan. Oh, he's leaving her unattended. And as a mother myself, of course, like I was naturally just angry and my emotions of losing my best friend also kind of caught in my judgment as well. Um, so they were going back and forth, uh, just like nitpicking court dates. It took like three years to for him to get even holidays and more time with her. And like, I think it was, it wasn't just weekends. So it was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday for Justin. So he got her Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, four days out of the week. So it was kind of like almost a, almost a 50, 50 because they shared holidays and, and stuff like that too. So the year before last, uh, Justin and I met up. He's like, I want to talk to you about like my side of the story. He told me his side of the story the shit he had been going through with Luana Mustafa and the manipulation games and, you know, his recollection of everything. And it just, it made sense to me um, hearing his side. It just, the facts were more clear. Um, And then what I ended up telling both of them, I was like, listen, I really don't care. I don't want to be involved in your court battle. I just want time with Tegan (laughs) Um, because that's my best friend's daughter. Like, Tegan means the world to me. I love her as much as my own children. Um, I just wanted time with her. And that was when Luana Mustafa started giving my numbers to Child Family Services to talk negatively about Justin. And that really pissed me off. I was kind of drawing, like dragged into the court battle. But after they were getting me involved with Child Family Services to do their bidding, I hopped onto Justin's side and helped him fight the remaining of the battle which ended up resulting into last year, a week long court battle, five days in court to go through everything. I took the stand during this court battle as well too. And the end verdict gave Justin um, primary custody with final decision-making with Len and Mustafa getting every other weekend and every Wednesday and shared holidays, including eat because, and Justin had nothing against them taking her for Eid or celebrating Eid. But they needed to give him heads up information because he doesn't celebrate Eid. He doesn't know the holidays. So it's like, hey, if Eid's coming up, can you just please let me know like a week in advance so I don't have any plans and I can make sure she's in your care for that time. Um, also during the court um, proceedings, they were considered at risk of fleeing the country and Tegan's passport was confiscated by the courts at this time and then released after trial was over. Um, And like I mentioned to you earlier, RCMP has confirmed that they have tried, at least in the past couple of years, that they have tried to flee the country three times. This last attempt was their third time. First time COVID stopped them in 2019. The second time they tried to flee, court stopped them and the passport was confiscated. And then the third time they got away with it and was able to flee successfully. So as Nikki has stated, the RCMP have been able to prove that this was the third time that Luann and Mustafa tried to leave the country illegally with Tegan. The court had actually flagged Tegan's passport during the hearings so that she would be stopped at any border in the event that she was abducted by Luann and Mustafa. But when the trial ended, the flagging on her passport was removed. 
In the court ruling, the judge admonished Luann for lying so much on the stand and acknowledged Justin's growth as a father and as a person. But in the same documents, the judge stated that there will come a day when Justin fully comes to terms with how much he owes the grandparents for their sacrifices that they made for his child. This judge is, of course, speaking about the people who would eventually abduct Tegan. As Nikki mentioned, in the judge's final order, he granted full custody and decision-making to Justin, with Mustafa and Luann having part-time access and alternating weekends with Tegan. The other item the judge allowed was that the grandparents would be allowed two separate nine-day chunks of time for the grandparents during the summer months when Tegan was out of school. This would perhaps be the worst decision by the family court. Let's get into what happens next after a word from our sponsors. Want the high stakes stuff? The believe the hype stuff? The criminally good, emotional roller coaster, can't believe what you're seeing stuff? You know, the good stuff. AMC Plus has it all. Can't wait for the beginning of the end? Watch all new episodes of The Walking Dead one week early. Want to be chilled to the core? Set sail with the North Water, a thrilling Arctic drama starring Jack O'Connell and Colin Farrell. Plus, uncover gripping true crime content ad free and on demand. Expect the epic with AMC Plus. Sign up today at amcplus.com. AMC Plus. Only the good stuff. And we are back. So before the break, we tried to give you an idea of the landscape of the events that led up to Tegan's abduction. We have a young father, Justin. We have a deceased young mother, Chelsea. We have Tegan, a vibrant young girl. And then we have the grandparents, Luann and Mustafa, who swooped in to seemingly help after Chelsea's death. But then a brutal custody battle ensued. Accusations were made by the grandparents in order to persuade the court to take Tegan away from Justin permanently. But despite its many mistakes, the family court did side with Justin and grant him full custody of his child, with the grandparents being granted a more part-time role, which included two nine-day periods for summer holidays. Justin had some concerns that Luann and Mustafa would abduct Tegan. He voiced those concerns to the courts. Justin was, and told his lawyers, told the judges, told everybody, we are concerned that, uh, like, they're lying, they're manipulating, and no one took it seriously. Everyone, it's just hearsay, it's just this, it's just that. And all the suspicious behavior was brought up in court, it was submitted as evidence, and no one took it seriously. No one took it seriously at all and just dismissed Justin this whole time. Like, why didn't they flag Tegan's passport after it was confiscated is my question as well. In the days and weeks leading up to Tegan's abduction, Justin began to see some changes happening at Mustafa and Luann's house on Fonda Green. Before we get into that, here is Nikki explaining what the house used to look like before the abduction. On our way to court one day, we stopped by their house and we took pictures of their backyard where they had like loose boards and like rusty nails like all over the place. And their house was, looked a lot like a hoarder's, a hoarder's house. Um, and that's also really important to know too, because they, their house was cluttered, like their yard was cluttered and the inside of their house was typically cluttered as well too. Just so much stuff. Just like I said, it, think of a hoarder's house and just like maybe a, a little, a couple notches under a hoarder's house is what their house looks like. And also Tegan had like um, a handmade loft bed. Like they had built her, they bought the lumber, they, they created this own loft bed playhouse for her. Um, also important because that will also lead into our, like why our suspicions came to fruit, I guess, um, for when we thought she was missing and what prompted everything. So that's what the house looked like before the abduction. Luann and Mustafa's house on Fonda Green was generally cluttered, almost like they were hoarders. And Tegan had a really cool loft-style bed in the basement of their house. So in late June 2021, Luann told Justin that she had a relative pass away in Sudbury, Ontario. She and Mustafa wanted to take Tegan to Ontario for one of their allotted nine-day visitations. 
Justin agreed, but Mustafa and Luann were not able to provide him with the basic details of the trip, like if they were flying or driving, staying with family or camping. This all seemed odd. And another odd thing was that a sea can shipping container appeared on the lawn of the grandparents' home. These are generally used for international shipping of many items, like furniture. Leading up to Tegan's abduction, um, we found out last minute. So they were allotted two nine-day periods in the summer for time with Tegan. And on June 23rd, Luann's brother-in-law, so her sister's husband, passed away. And she said, well, we want to drive up to Sudbury. We want to do, or they didn't even say drive. They said, we're going to Sudbury because Justin asked, are you driving or are you flying? And they wouldn't answer him. Um, So they said, we're going to Sudbury. We're going to a funeral and we're going to do a camping trip as well, too. Uh, We're taking her on July 3rd. And then she was supposed to be back nine days after. So so the night before, um, not even the night before, but a few like weeks before, Um, there was a sea can on the property, which is like one of those huge shipping containers. Uh, Justin ended up taking pictures of the company and the serial number of the sea can because he just, he didn't sit right with him. And he has learned from all this fight, fighting through the courts for the past four years to just document everything. Even if it's not needed, just document it and just have it on hand in case you do. Um, he took some pictures of it, and Tegan had mentioned that her bedroom had been taken apart. So I mentioned the homemade loft bed playhouse in her room. Her bedroom had been completely taken apart, and she had no bed to sleep in, is what she was telling her dad. And we knew, because they kept talking in the courts, that they were doing renovations on the house. So we kind of just brushed it off, like kind of put it on the side, like, okay, they're doing renovations, so that's probably why they took down this huge playhouse. Uh, the night before... She went to her grandparents' house. She was actually supposed to have a sleepover at my house, and I was supposed to drive her. I was supposed to drive her to her grandparents' house the next day. And I was just starting my night shift. So I said, you know, you're going away for nine days. When you come back, you can have your weekend sleepover at at our house because she's really good friends with my daughter. (sighs) Sorry, that I hold a lot of guilt for that. Because I have a feeling if I had just taken her, I would have known that something was wrong. Um, sorry. So uh, she didn't want to go on the trip. And um, because we're already, we were still fighting. Like court was still going on even with Justin having custody and having what he wanted. The grandparents weren't happy. And they were just throwing him with, like throwing affidavits after affidavits after him trying to get custody back. And I think, honestly, and this is just my opinion, that they were just trying to distract him and keep him off guard on what they were actually doing. Um, But she didn't want to go. You know, we were sitting on my back deck and we're like, no, you're going to have a fun time. You're going to go see all your cousins and your aunts and uncles. and You're going to have a great time. But she didn't want to go. So I don't know if she knew um, if she wasn't going to Ontario or not. During the nine-day period that Tegan was with Luann and Mustafa, Justin began to get a bad feeling. He then received an email from Luann and Mustafa saying that they needed to extend their trip and use their other nine days. So uh, coming up to the end of their nine days, we get an email on July 8th saying that they were going to extend their trip to in Ontario because they were, quote, running behind. And uh, the didn't fit well with Justin. And so he went to the house, to the grandparents' house, and he saw that all the vehicles were gone. Uh, the sea can that had been on the property for weeks was gone. The backyard, everything that was in there, gone. Like, they had trailers in there. They had a huge playground back there and, you know, renovation stuff. Everything was gone. The security camera that they had installed less than six months ago was taken down. The windows were boarded up and Justin was able to see through the basement window that it was completely cleared out. Now, this was suspicious to both of us because, like I mentioned, they lived like hoarders. So for it to be completely cleared out like that sent alarm bells. So Justin went to the Calgary Police Service to report Tegan as a missing and abducted child. 
but the authorities told him he had to wait until the second nine-day period was up because technically, Tegan was in her grandparents' court-appointed custody until July 21st. We called the police, and the police took it very seriously at first. I mean, it's not that they're not taking it seriously now, but efforts are, they feel so minimal, and we've been doing everything and trying to get Tegan home. And it feels like our government and our national authorities aren't doing anything. At least that's what it feels like. Um, So what they did was uh, police came over uh, to my house. They took a statement from Justin. They went to a judge and got a warrant that night to do a wellness check in Sudbury. Uh, They went to the, uh, the house in which they were supposed to be at for this funeral. And we found out that they had never been there. So the police said at that time that there is nothing that they can do until the 18 days are up. So we waited until the 18th before warrants were issued, before anything could be done. And they had even confirmed before the 18 days were up that they had boarded a plane in Vancouver on July 8th and flew to Turkey. They had CCTV footage of them boarding the plane with Tegan and leaving, and they still didn't do anything until those 18 days were up, even though they knew that they did not have permission for Tegan to be removed from the country, and they still didn't do anything until those 18 days were up. Many listeners at this point may be wondering how they were able to fly Tegan out of the country. Well, we have obtained the passport application that Luann and Mustafa submitted to Service Canada. In that application, they forged Justin's signature. They also indicated that Fonda Green was Tegan's address. This was actually Luann and Mustafa's address. She did not live there. And these were not the only lies that they told on the passport application. There are 13 examples of forgery and misinformation on the document. Nope. Nothing was flagged. Not even Tegan. Like, and when I said that this could have been completely preventable, they could have just flagged Tegan's passport. Now, I don't know if I touched base on this, but how they were able to obtain a passport, and we actually talked to RCMP today about this as well, um, which leads into our frustration with, that wasn't RCMP, we talked to uh, Calgary Police Department um, about this today. So they filled out an application and fraudulently signed Justin's name on this passport application for Tegan. They marked off that there were no existing court orders, and because Chelsea's dead, they didn't need an additional parent to confirm that it was okay for him to apply for this passport. Um, Passport Canada said that someone would have had to come pick up the passport, and Justin, quote, even they wrote Justin's name on it, so Justin technically would have had to pick up the passport, which means someone would have had to impersonate him to go pick up the passport at service canada so we at we asked the police today how who picked up the passport because honestly like how 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 did this slip through the cracks her passport was expired so luana mustafa filed for a new passport under justin's name so they fra- and that's one of their warrants right now as well too for impersonating and for uh forging government documents so justin had no idea that this passport was even applied for until this investigation started. And we talked to the police today and we're like, well, why aren't you going to Service Canada? And they said, quote, unless we know which Service Canada they went to, we can't really do much, unquote. In order for Luann and Mustafa to retrieve the passport, someone would have had to have gone into the passport office and impersonate Justin. So it is very possible that Luann and Mustafa have been aided by other people in order to abduct Tegan. But who they are, we don't know. The passport office seems like a good place to start. They have CCTV, and someone would have had to have signed for Tegan's passport. Calgary Police Service have not followed up on this at all, claiming it would be too hard for them to figure out which office they used. However, there is a passport office within a 10-minute walk of the grandparents' home. So the working theory right now is that Mustafa and Luann had been planning this for a long time. They had even attempted it multiple times beforehand. By the time the final court judgment came in, they had sent over $170,000 into an Egyptian bank in order 
to have money once they landed. It is believed that they first went to Turkey and then made their way to Egypt. We asked Nikki where the investigation is at today. RCMP and police have been pretty tight-lipped about it all. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't even show us the pictures of them at, like, the CC. They wouldn't even show us the CCTV footage of them in the Vancouver airport leaving with Tegan. We don't know what she was wearing. We don't know if she was in a hijab or not. Um, I know Luann wears a hijab now. She's fully converted. Um, we don't know what she was wearing. We don't know if they cut her hair. We don't know anything. Um, as for evidence, we do know that the house has been cleared out um, completely. And that's really it. So we know that Mustafa, Luann, and Tegan boarded a plane in Vancouver flying to Turkey. And we are guessing that their final destination is Cairo in Egypt. But one of the things we don't know is if Luann and Mustafa are traveling under their own names, um, especially in between the border of Turkey and Egypt. And the thing is that using fake documents or fake names is quite possible with these two. So it is unknown at this time if Mustafa and Luann crossed the border into Egypt with Tegan. This is an important piece of the puzzle due to something known as the Hague Convention. According to the Canadian government website, the Hague Convention protects children and their families against the risks of illegal, irregular, premature, or ill-prepared adoptions abroad. To do this, the Hague Convention puts in two different things. They put in safeguards uh, in place to make sure that all intercountry adoptions are in the best interest of the child and respects their human rights. The other thing it puts into place is a system of cooperation among countries to guarantee that these safeguards are respected and to prevent abduction of, sale of, or traffic in children. For Hague adoptions, the authorities in both countries must agree to go ahead with the adoption. This basically means that it is illegal to abduct a child from Canada and then adopt them in a country that is covered by the Hague Convention. Turkey is a part of the Hague Convention. However, Egypt is not. So finding any cooperation between the Canadian and Egyptian governments on this case may prove to be very difficult. Yeah, in fact, Justin, Nikki, and the army of people working to bring Tegan home have been told by multiple governing bodies that they are on their own. We were told uh, before the day we went live, like public, um, the day we went public, they told us to hold off and we held off and, uh, we held off until, what was it? The 21st to go public was when we posted the page when they said, there's nothing much more that we can do. It's in your hands now. That's what our local police, RCMP and global affairs said to us. So we have been doing everything ourselves. So let's let that sink in as we take a quick break and return with the conclusion of this episode. She's a very honest, innocent, and very beautiful, such a lucky father to have a daughter like Tegan. Justin Coates is desperate to find his little girl. He says he last saw her July 2nd, before she headed off on holidays with her maternal grandparents, part of a shared custody agreement. There's still no, uh, no leads as to where they are currently. The three were supposed to be headed to Ontario. Coots says he then got an email that they were extending their trip. He contacted police, then says he received information they had traveled to Turkey and possibly Egypt. We have confirmed that they, they've uh, forged my signature and a uh, fraudulent application for a passport has been put through and was granted. A massive social media campaign has been launched to bring Tegan home. It's been shared locally, nationally and internationally. Still, no luck, according to Calgary Police and Global Affairs Canada. I've been uh, told that there's nothing else much they can do locally. The challenge really becomes when the Calgary Police have to coordinate with the federal police, the RCMP, who then in turn have to coordinate with the federal police of the country where the child's at. Sundberg says it also depends if the country Tegan was taken to has an agreement with Canada. This is an incredibly complex, heartbreaking and convoluted process. And it can take a long time to find resolution, if ever. 
Coots isn't willing to give up hope or his little girl, who already lost her mom when she was just a few months old. She's lost so many people already. She doesn't deserve this. Calgary police confirm a Canada-wide warrant has been issued for the grandparents on the charges of child abduction. Tomasia Da Silva, Global News. That was a clip of a news story by reporter Tomasia Da Silva that aired on Global News on July 27, 2021. We wanted to play that clip because we wanted you to hear the emotion in Justin's voice as he speaks about his daughter. He is going through a parent's worst nightmare right now, trying to get his daughter back. So before the break, it was clear that Justin and Nikki were left on their own, according to the government and local law enforcement. At the time of this podcast, that hasn't changed, but something has. Nikki and Justin have galvanized a small army of people who are trying to help. We first learned of this case because of the social media campaign, hashtag Bring Tegan Home. We quickly joined the Facebook group Bring Tegan Home and asked if we could help. In this group are many smart, skilled, and compassionate people who are combing the internet for clues as to where Mustafa and Luann have gone. Both Mustafa and Luann have deleted their many social media accounts over the last few weeks, but there have been some clues as to where they have gone. Here is Nikki telling us more about the effort to bring Tegan home and the obstacles families will face if their child is internationally abducted from Canada. We have been doing everything ourselves. You know, the we got Global News to do a local story. So Global Calgary did a local story. CTV Calgary did a local story. And the local newspaper did a local story. But we've been trying to press for this to go across Canada or even farther. And no one's getting back to us because we don't have updates. And we don't have updates because <laughs> we're the ones doing all the work. We don't have, like, any solid concrete evidence for an investigation. We're not police. We're not RCMP, we're not Interpol, we're not Global Affairs. Um, But we're doing everything ourselves. We're raising the funds ourselves because if they're possibly in Egypt, we don't qualify under the Hague Convention and there's like uh, special funding for that as well too. Um, And I hear every day that, oh my God, I just heard about this story. Why isn't this national? Oh my God, I just heard about this. Like, And I'm in BC. Why isn't it being covered in BC? They left in Vancouver. Ontario was involved. Like, why isn't it widespread across the country? And it's like, they gave it like it's five minutes of fame and just like, okay, that, well, that's that. It's over now. Unless, unless she's home, we don't really care. Unless you're actually on your way to get her. We don't care. That's what it really feels like. And Justin's really frustrated. I'm really frustrated. We're both frustrated on this. Like, like Justin, like gratefully his work is giving him time off. He has a job to go back to. Once Tegan has been recovered, he's getting, like, still a paycheck and stuff like that, like, half of his paycheck. But, you know, this is, this is our full-time job. Like, I wake up and I have, like, 50 messages to respond to, like, a list of things that I need to do. I need to contact the translators. I need to contact, you know, whoever's helped, like, our team is what we've been calling them, our team who's been helping us. Uh, we need to work on the events and the fundraising. How are we going to get money? How are we going to how are we going to pay for tickets to go to Egypt? How are we going to pay for a lawyer in Egypt or Turkey? Or how are we going to pay for like? There's just so there's so much to it that a lot of people don't even realize. And we have these moments of I don't know awareness where it's like, is this actually happening right now? Like I feel like I've been thrown into an like an action movie, like of of an abduction. Like it doesn't, it seems so surreal. And when I talk to, you know, friends or new people about it, I feel like I'm bullshitting half the time because I just, I can't comprehend that this is how serious this is and how this is actually happening. Like it's just, it shouldn't have happened. Um, And our plan is once she is home and we are very uh, confident that she will come home, that uh, we want to start a foundation after. And uh, so no family has to go through this again because it was too easy for them to leave the country and change definitely needs to be made, be made. And it needs to be made yesterday. (laughs) So as of today, there's not much information, but we do know a few things. We know that Justin has filed for a lien against Mustafa and Luann's home. We also know that Mustafa and Luann have friends or family members entering and exiting their Fonda Green home regularly. 
We know that there are multiple Canada-wide warrants issued for their arrest, and should they ever come back to Canada, they will be arrested. The warrants include the following. Forging false documents with the intent to abduct a child. Impersonation with the intent to abduct a child. Submitting and forging false government documents with the intent to abduct a child. And premeditated kidnapping and child abduction. There are people out there who are not supportive of the movement to bring Tegan home. Sadly, as we have seen in many of the cases that we have covered, there has been some internet trolling. The internet, as we have stated in the past, can be a terrible place. There have been some people online saying that Tegan is home with her father. This is not true. There have been family members or friends of Luann who have continued to call Justin abusive or a bad dad online. And some others have tried to paint Luann as an innocent victim in all this. This is something that Nikki would like to set the record straight on. She wants people to know unequivocally that Luann is not some kind of victim. In fact, she, in Nikki's words, was the mastermind behind this entire abduction. But knowing Luann for as long as I have... And the character of who she is, like, again, her daughter and I were really, really close. Um, She was, she's just a terrible person in general. She's a mass manipulator. And if she wants something, she'll do whatever she wants rather. And she thinks she's above the law to do it. So she's not innocent in this case. And then once they got over to Egypt, I think Mustafa was the one who took over from there. So there are two peas in a pod. That's for sure. The trolling has also continued offline. People in the Fonda Green neighborhood have taken down the abduction posters with Tegan, Luann, and Mustafa's photos on them. And some people have keyed cars with Bring Tegan Home decals on them. We asked Nikki how our listeners could help in the fight to bring Tegan home. Share and share. Awareness is the biggest thing. It's not even about the donations. Like, we have... We have everything, like, we have things covered. Like, if you can donate, great. But the main part is, is awareness. Like, a, a young child was taken under fraudulent documents and lies and manipulation and our government and our borders just let it happen. Like, it's, this could have been prevented. And this is not the first time that it's happened. So awareness is the most important thing to us. And we'll figure everything else out if we, like, when it comes to funding if we have to. But this could have been prevented. It could have been prevented completely. And that's exactly why Justin and I want to start the foundation when we're done. This will never happen again. Not if, like, I'll be so far up people's asses, it's not even funny. Like, like it's just, that is our goal. Like, after Tegan's home, we'll set the world on fire if we have to, to make change. Like, I'm, it's been something we've been talking about, like, between like fundraising and plans and investigations and stuff. And like one day he's like, I really want to start a foundation. I was like, that was my idea first. But yeah, you can come on to my idea. According to a CTV news article published in 2019, there are over 250 active international child abduction files. These children have been abducted from Canada and taken to various nations around the world. In all of those cases, the child was abducted by a family member. And in many cases, the child was stolen by the guardian who wasn't granted full custody. These cases are often complicated and slowed down by international red tape. Successfully reuniting the child and bringing them back to Canada can seem impossible. But there have been hundreds of reunifications over the years. Tegan Coots was abducted on July 8, 2021. She was last seen on CCTV footage boarding a plane to Turkey at Vancouver International Airport. We do not know what she was wearing. She is seven years old with hazel eyes, dirty blonde hair, and pierced ears. She stands four foot tall and weighs 45 pounds. If you saw Tegan that day at the airport, or if you have any information that will help, you are asked to call Crime Stoppers. If you have connections in Cairo, or the country of Egypt, if you have connections in Ankara or Istanbul, Turkey. If you think you can help, please join the Facebook group Bring Tegan Home. If you or your family member has suffered a similar fate 
and you can offer some advice to Justin and Nikki, please join the group. We will list it in our show notes. We would like to thank Nikki and Justin for trusting us with this story. Please share this episode and our Facebook posts about this case, and let's bring Tegan home. Our producers on the podcast are Amy's Book Reviews, Thomas E., Susan S., Alex and Andrea P., Kennedy, Alberta, Cindy McD., Blair M., Alyssa S., CJ Jeze, Anastasia, Ariel E., Melanie E., Kelly D., Carolyn M., Emily L., Jason D., Jimmy H., Tiffany C., Keith R., Mari M., Lorena, Queen Nebula, Maureen, Jesse D. R., and The Missing and Unexplained Podcast. We will be back soon with a new episode, so until then, stay safe, everyone. Stay safe. Want the high-stakes stuff? The believe-the-hype stuff? The criminally good, emotional roller coaster? can't believe what you're seeing stuff? You know, the good stuff. AMC Plus has it all. Can't wait for the beginning of the end? Watch all new episodes of The Walking Dead one week early. Want to be chilled to the core? Set sail with the North Water, a thrilling Arctic drama starring Jack O'Connell and Colin Farrell. Plus, uncover gripping true crime content ad-free and on demand. Expect the epic with AMC Plus. Sign up today at amcplus.com. AMC Plus, only the good stuff. ACAST recommends more podcasts, more episodes, more great shows. Keep listening to hear a new show we recommend. In a home in the suburbs, a boy dreamed of saving all the poor children off the wall. He built a charity that attracted the world's top celebrities. Hey, I'm Justin Bieber, and this is we did. This has become your life's work. But behind the scenes, things started popping up. Allegations about corruption, blackmail. This is the story of a charity that did well when it was supposed to be doing good. The White Saviors, a Canada Land original podcast. A cast recommends. 